Hi, my name is Isabel Martinez, and I'm going to be talking about assisted reproductive technology, specifically regarding its potential in the conservation of endangered mammals. Due to the human-induced effects of climate change, rapid urbanization, poaching, and the exponential increase of the human population, natural ecosystems around the world are consistently being disturbed or destroyed. With this loss of potential habitats, many species, including large mammals, are becoming endangered or reaching extinction. Assisted reproductive technology, referred to as ART, is not a new function available to biologists. However, its use has been limited to certain species due to its need for in-depth research and monitoring. Though most developments in ART's compatibility with large endangered mammals is only known to the science and conservation worlds, progress is still being made. The progression of the presentation will follow this general outline. I will define ART in all of its possibly more familiar uses. Next, I will describe the steps that need to take place in this process, and then explain how large mammals pose a specific and complicated feat for scientists. In a more conservationist lens, I will describe the work of zoos in these studies, and finally explain the future of this technology for endangered mammals. ART is being and has been used by humans since the 1970s with the process of IVF or in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization was initially considered wildly unnatural and unethical by medical professionals, but the demand and subsequent studies performed were strong enough to change the tide of public opinion. The first human child born from IVF was born in 1978 in England. As doctors Ashley Askew and Emily Jungheim explained, Decades of studying human reproductive functions and organs dictated the scientists' actions in the process of removing a single oocyte from the woman's ovary after she had a natural menstrual cycle. Fertilizing the oocyte in vitro, meaning outside of the organism, and then transferring the eight-cell embryo back into her uterus. Today, millions of children are born as a result of IVF, and though the rates of success are around 50%, research is constantly being done. Similarly, a study completed by biology professors Peter Leckie, Jay Watson, and Sterling Chaikin from University of California, Davis, showed successful artificial inseminations of mice in 1973. Because mice and other rodents are the most common species used in labs, there is extensive knowledge about their anatomy and functions. The second image illustrates one advancement that came as a result of IVF, which is genetic testing. This blastocyst is having cells removed from its right side to be tested for genetic mutations the parents may have passed to the embryo. The general process by which assisted reproductive technology would assist in the artificial insemination takes place in three steps. In his review for the Society for the Study of Reproduction in 2019, scientist Jason Herrick of the Department of Reproductive Science at the Omaha Zoo detailed the existing understanding of ART and the work that needs to be done to make ART effective for conservation of large mammals. Step 1, identifying reproductive traits is the most important and telling step in this process. Reproductive traits include the seasonality of mating, the length of menstrual cycles and fertility, and the species-specific functions of the uterus, as well as the analysis of hormones. The most common or direct way to collect this data would be through blood samples. However, scientists have found ways to study fecal matter and urine to identify information about specific animals that were not well researched. Only a few species in captivity, such as the Sumatran rhinoceros, have been trained to receive routine blood work and other close contact with human caretakers. Step two is semen collection and characterization, which means exactly how it sounds. Herrick explained that for males in a given species, safe semen collection is necessary to study the properties of that species' semen. Different semen have different ejaculate traits, like quantity and quality, as well as specific conditions that would allow their best preservation for later use in the lab. Semen collection can be difficult because not all animals are trained to cooperate with scientists. Common reproductive technology used to extract semen is known as electroejaculation, where release of semen is stimulated by a machine or tool of the scientist. One species that cooperates and yields quality sperm at one time is bottlenose dolphins, but in the adverse situation, black-footed ferrets, like many other small cats, have to be under anesthesia to provide a semen sample, and even then, the samples are so small, scientists need to compile several samples to complete sufficient studies. If the two steps are successful, the third step is merely left to chance. Step three is artificial insemination. This is the step where the sperm from the male specimen is deposited into the female specimen's reproductive organ at a specific location and time. 
Once the sperm is placed or injected, the success of the fertilization depends on the actions of the sperm and whether or not the studies of the female were accurate or precise. Although alternative measures of semen collection and blood samples have been used, data has shown that artificial insemination has been more successful overall with animals that are trained to interact with their caretakers and whose natural routines have not been drastically disturbed. Though the process seems complicated, hope for use of ART in conservation of large mammals comes from successes with amphibians and birds, which were not groups that scientists originally believed artificial insemination would be successful. One example was seen in a study of Magellanic penguins. Justine Kelly O'Brien and a team of four other scientists in association with the SeaWorld Research Center in San Diego and Loyola University Medical Center in Illinois explained how artificial insemination has been relatively successful in avian species, even non-domesticated ones. However, the fertilization has mostly taken place with fresh semen rather than cryopreserved or frozen semen. Cryopreservation has shown to be a key connection between ART and conservation because successful fertilization of female specimens with frozen semen could ensure possibilities of offspring if a male dies or if there is not one near. O'Brien and the team of scientists inseminated five penguin females with frozen thawed semen over a total of eight egg production cycles. They studied other samples of frozen semen for its motility, its path velocity, and its plasma integrity. The scientists found that, though average motility dropped 12% after being thawed, overall fertility of the female penguin was 53%, and the likeliness of hatching was 50%. In conclusion, the use of cryopreserved semen in artificial insemination had proven feasible, safe, and a sustainable option for zoos and wildlife centers. While cryopreservation is useful and its further studying could help many species, there are still many research-based as well as ethical questions that scientists and conservationists face. From this study alone, two years of semen collection and simultaneous study of female penguins took place. After insemination and fertilization, female penguins had to be separated from the rest of their community and also could not monitor their own eggs, as scientists wanted to see as little complications or interferences with their study. The size and relative personality of this species could partially be attributed to the success of the research, with other large mammals whose populations continue to dwindle and are the focus of conservation programs around the world. They cannot all be domesticated, nor should they be. How many times can or should an animal be put under anesthesia for blood work or insemination? What if a male does not produce enough healthy semen by machine probing? Because scientists want to maintain the natural tendencies of these endangered animals, they are at odds with ethics and conservation. This leads me to a discussion of two studies of large and endangered mammals that focus on specific parts of reproduction and the use of technology for analysis. Cheryl S. Asa, Randall E. Jung, and four other scientists performed a study of the reproductive cycles and pregnancy in cheetahs for the Zoo Biology Journal in association with the St. Louis Zoological Park and the Biology Department of Washington University in St. Louis using genome cytology or the study of cells in the animal's vagina. In this study, three female cheetahs were subjected to vaginal smears two to three times a week and blood samples once a week. Two cheetahs were tested for over 100 weeks, and the other cheetah was tested for 15 weeks. Although Jason Herrick explained how felids, or wild cats, are some of the most intensely studied wildlife species, their ovarian cycles fluctuate and vary a lot. Asa and the team of scientists can attest to this, explaining how their choice of cheetahs for research was in part due to the lack of information on the cheetah's reproductive cycle and, furthermore, because their population in the wild continues to decrease and their reproduction in captivity is not entirely hopeful. The cheetahs were kept on the same diets and were allowed to interact with male cheetahs. The goal of this study was to analyze the levels of different hormones, progesterone and estradiol, and the correlation of hormone levels with mating and successful fertilization. These hormone levels were studied because they are also related to the development of certain superficial and anuclear cells. The conclusion of the weeks of testing shows the scientists that ovarian cycles of cheetahs were not unlike other felids. However, this proposed mating season does not guarantee incre increased reproductive rates for cheetahs in captivity. The second study was conducted by Thomas B. Hildebrandt, Robert Hermes, and eight other scientists, also for the Zoo Biology Scientific Journal, with the support and resources of research centers and zoos in Germany, Thailand, and the U.S. 
This study was performed with some urgency, made clear by the introduction that began with, the success rate of captive elephant breeding programs worldwide is poor, and later discussed how disease and poaching are also impacting the survival of elephant populations. The focus of the study was to use ultrasonography, or the use of ultrasound pulses to evaluate specific parts of the body, or in this case, the urogenital tract, as well as semen collections, to possibly determine any male reproductive dysfunction. Elephants in captivity were tested from nine institutions in North America, 13 in Europe, two in Africa, and seven in Asia. Some assessments were performed with the animals in, in restraints, some were trained, and others were assessed under anesthesia. Male elephants, or bulls, were categorized by their breeding history. However, this study did not produce consistent results among species. The study was able to find conclusions about the breeding capability of specific bulls, but they could not determine reasons that bulls were less compatible or successful in reproduction or fertilization because no patterns arose with semen quality, quantity, or causes of infertility. These two studies show how progress is being made so that ART can help in the conservation of endangered species. However, there are still many challenges to be faced with specific animals and also in ethical justifications of manipulating the lives and processes of animals, even if they are in captivity. One bright light in the future of all endangered mammals in captivity is the presence of zoos. Although many zoos are physically impeded from growth or proper spacing of animals because of their most common metropolitan location, Zoos have become prominent research centers and conservation advocates. Decades before, zoos developed reproductive assistance merely to maintain their own populations, but now, ART is being used for the responsibility zoos hold of caring for some of the last living individuals of different species. The goal of reproduction in zoos today, explained by Jason Herrick, is to maintain a sustainable population of animals that could ensure the survival of that species should it ever go extinct in the wild. Sustainability in reproduction means maintaining 90% of that species' genetic diversity, ensuring a baseline number of individuals that should be born in each generation, and that minimal inbreeding, if any, should occur. Herrick makes it clear that re reproduction of species in captivity is no longer random. He also explains that the zoo industry is not expanding, meaning new zoos are not being established, though sustainable reproduction is increasing. For this reason, reproduction must be intentional and done with the animal's best interests in mind, in terms of their habitat space and their health. Furthermore, connections between zoos are essential for possible transfers of individuals, information sharing, and overall decision making regarding, regarding science. Of course, these practices are not always best for the overall well-being of the animals. This is where zoos have become hubs of ART research. One such example is the San Diego Zoo, right here in Southern California, which developed their own Institute for Conservation Research. They have their researchers and scientists divided into eight teams with different areas of focus, such as population sustainability, conservation genetics, and biodiversity banking, using backgrounds of veterinary medicine and multidisciplinary science. The Institute also has conservation initiatives, which are niche discussions regarding a specific location or a trait of a species, such as saving African primates. San Diego Zoo and its dedication to conservation is an inspiring example for the future of endangered mammals in captivity. Although the future for ART and successful conservation of the most threatened species seems distant, it is not impossible. The studies, however invasive or unclear, are yielding results in providing something we did not know previously. Conservation is a feasible goal, it is simply a slow process. The most recent groundbreaking studies using ART pertain to coral species. The studies in my presentation are other examples of progress in animal studies, but there are also new developments in assisted reproductive technologies and practices. One of the new practices being tested with rodents involves the use of induced stem cells to create gametes. Scientists hope to apply this technique to southern white rhinos who have already had stem cells isolated. Another new technique involves preserving germplasms for long periods of time or in room temperature, which could be very beneficial for uses with wild specimen. Lastly, scientists have made it clear that in-depth research of population gen and genetics of species needs to continue for the accuracy and success of ART in conservation. Thank you for listening and wish you all the best.